like to welcome you to today's Medical Center Hour. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities, and we're very pleased to bring you these weekly Medical Center Hours. Our program today is called The Eating Disorders, an Invisible Epidemic. There's plenty of mythology surrounding eating disorders. One common myth is that these illnesses are time-limited and resolve when a young woman leaves adolescence. Another is that only women experience eating disorders. Our Medical Center Hour today calls out such myths, dispelling images and impressions perpetuated sometimes by celebrity culture and popular media. In a society that for decades has revered ever thinner, thinner bodies, and now also celebrates an extremely fit body that is at once lean and overtly muscular, an estimated 25 to 30 million Americans currently suffer from eating disorders. The afflicted include men and women of all ages, all ethnicities. And so alongside this country's well-publicized obesity epidemic, rages another quite invisible epidemic of eating disorders. Today we'll address eating disorders and related questions from three perspectives. That of a university student in recovery, that of a parent and national advocate, and that of a health educator in a UVA-based prevention program. So I'd ask you to join me in welcoming um, Robin Munn, um, <coughs> family counselor and resident of Charlottesville. Also MD, PhD student Brooks Broderick, and Amy Chestnut, the Women's Center's Eating Disorders Education Coordinator. Uh, you'll find information, biographical information, and a little more specific information about their present positions uh, in your handout. Following their presentations, we'll have time to hear your voices as well, your questions and comments. We're very grateful to have the UVA Women's Center as our co-sponsor for this program. And I'll just quickly mention that all of our speakers completed conflict of interest <laughs> disclosure forms and none had any financial conflict of interest. So we'll begin with uh, Robbie Munn, then uh, Brooks Broderick, and Amy Chestnut. Well. all of you today for coming and sharing your lunch hour here, deciding to spend it here. I hope that you walk away with a slightly different idea than when you came in the door. I'm not asking you to learn more, I'm just asking you to think a little bit differently. Let me begin by telling you why I am interested in this issue. This is a picture of my mother. She was born in 1910. That picture is taken around the age of 14 or so from a passport photo. <clears throat> this is my niece. She was born in 1963. Her picture is about age 16, 17 there. This is a picture of my daughter, about the same age. Some people say they see a resemblance. And then there's me. So this is a story about DNA, story of hope, story of too much loss, and hope for the future. Each of these women and myself had serious illnesses with eating disorders. My mother having been born in 1910, it was completely undiagnosed. I knew growing up that I lived in an odd situation, but at that point in time, there was no language that described eating disorders. And so things like depression, anxiety, rage, uh, agoraphobia, all eventually came to describe her. She had lots and lots of physical symptoms too. My memory is though, as a child and as a young adult, increasingly, she never left the house. She didn't take me to college. She never saw me in college. Um, the last 10 years of her life, she ate four different kinds of food each of which have to be done in a very particular way, or she would get very anxious and very angry. And there were other odd things that would go on in the house. For instance, we had this game that she and I would play, whereby she would invite me to compare thigh sizes with her. 
First, we're very thin. Of course, the older I got, mine got larger. So if you're wondering why I'm not wearing a dress today, it's because I still have a little bit of a problem with my legs. Nobody knew what was wrong with her. However, when she died in 1979, a psychiatrist who had been treating her said to me, and this was the first time I had heard the word anorexia, I have two graduate degrees in psychology. I also have eight years of postgraduate training at the Bowen Center in Georgetown. But I would be very typical of anybody in the 1970s or 1980s, even with excellent graduate programs, in terms of my virtually total ignorance of what was an eating disorder. I was very representative of who was treating at the time and of the public. At the time of her death in 1979, uh, the psychiatrist said, I've never met anybody who's lived as long as she has with anorexia. And that was the first time that anybody had used that word, and it stuck in my head. My niece, born in 1963, it was always commented upon how much she looked like her grandmother. As time went on, it became evident um, they were, in, in very odd and curious ways, very similar. They had similar ways of interacting with the world. They were both extremely bright. My niece, Janet, uh, was invited to join the Mensa Society when she was 12, and yet she was never able to finish college. She was a kind of young, life thing that would walk into a room, and everybody wanted to be near her. They all wanted her to be in their circle and yet she didn't know how to keep or make friends for most of her life. Two years ago, when I was the uh, board chair of the National Eating Disorders Association, we had a, a big event, a big gala up in um, New York in April, and that was on a Thursday. On Wednesday morning when I woke up, I found out that Janet had committed suicide. This was not her first attempt, but it was her most successful one. She had, in fact, gone out and bought a gun, and within 24 hours was dead. That changed a lot for me. Where I was impassioned before, I simply became more impassioned. And what I said to everybody in that room that night was that people don't end up in a room or a conference like this if you don't have a personal or a professional eating, or interest, sorry, in eating disorders. Everybody in the room that night and I would imagine quite a few of the people here, all of you have a Janet in your life. And I just want to tell you that that's what the National Eating Disorders is all about, that we're fighting for all of the Janets. My daughter, um, in the spring, in the summer of 1996, she had just graduated from seventh grade from Camden School. Three weeks later, she was abducted. She was gone for 10 years. She developed a very hard and fast case of anorexia, followed by bulimia, followed by self-harm, followed by alcoholism, followed by drug abuse. She had been the kind of student where every teacher always wanted her in her <coughs> class. By the time she had hit the end of middle school, we were struggling to find schools that would accept her because of her behavior. She ended up missing school, first in high school for essentially a full year. She wasn't in school. She wasn't well enough to go to school. And again, in college, it took her another year to graduate from college, but she did. When she got sick, my reaction was intense and fast because of the information that I had about my mother and because what I was learning about anorexia as my niece had been so ill. And I knew somehow that Jenny was on the same path and that we had to act hard and fast to try to prevent her from falling down the kind of courses that they had gone. And then um, I also learned when Jenny became ill what had happened to me. I had held hands with anorexia for about 20 years from my late teens through my early 30s. I never really knew what was wrong. I knew something was wrong. <clears throat> and again, two graduate degrees, postgraduate training, but I didn't fit at all. What was the standard definition of anorexia at that time? I didn't know what was wrong with me. All I knew was I had a problem. I would not learn what it was until later.
This is my mother at, um, it's a portrait I have of her in my house. She's about age 28. <clears throat> Here's a picture of Janet as she was around the same age. Again, I'm just asking you to look at the similarities. What I came to understand was how that was a package deal. This is the genogram in my family, my mother, me, my daughter, Janet. A couple of years ago, there's a, a gentleman in the field who's internationally renowned for his initial, um, he's one of the first people that started looking at genetics and how they're involved in eating disorders. Walt is very bright. Um, he kept losing people at, at his presentations, however, because the information that he was giving everybody was so complicated, they were having trouble following it. So I went to him one day and I said, let's put a face on genetics. Let's see if we can help people understand what you're talking about. And that was the first time that I did any kind of presentation like this. And it was very amusing. Um, he did the same presentation he's always done, and his results went through the roof. People just needed an anchor to try to understand what he was talking about back then because it was such a novel concept that there could be genetic underpinnings to eating disorders. That was the beginning about five to six years ago when we in the field began to try to get people in every walk of life to understand that these are not choices, they're not phases. Once they catch hold, they're not gonna go away easily. They may not go away by themselves at all. And they will destroy life, love, and work just like a lot of other diseases. They're no different. These are serious psychiatric diseases. So that is what led me to become involved with the National Eating Disorders. <clears throat> Back in um, 2000, I was one of the first non-clinicians, even though I had the degrees, I wasn't a practicing clinician at that point, certainly knew nothing about how to treat eating disorders. I was simply trying to keep my own daughter alive in my house and I was one of the first parents who was asked to join the national board. There were parents like me all over the country. We had yet to find a way of getting to know each other, but we have. And we have, in the last decade, I hope, um, sparked a little revolution for every, any, any of you who know about eating disorders. There was a point in time when parents and families were very much blamed. They were looked at the way that families of schizophrenics would have looked at, been looked at 25 years ago. They were looked at the way families of bipolar were looked at 15 years ago. They were looked at the way families of autistic children were looked at until only 10 or so years ago. We were to blame. And so families were completely discouraged from being part of any of the treatment team. They also received no information about what to do when their child came home. It was no wonder that treatment was going so badly. It, it just made no sense to me and to many other families who were with me. So when I entered the field of eating disorders, January 6, 1996, so probably 1998 or so, I began to get serious about it, serious in a sense of being an advocate. Um, I felt like I'd walked into this really bizarre time war, and there were a lot of very, very angry and disillusioned and frightened, frightened families. And we've all been working together to try to steer that ship in a slightly different direction. That's a summary of what I just did. What I want to do for the rest of the time today, please, is talk to you about the ways in which we in the field at this point in time are beginning to be able to look at how we might be able to mark some of these genetic tendencies. Think of them not so much as genes or traits, but as heritability. The possibility of these traits becoming expressed in a particular way because of environmental illness. Uh, environment, I'm sorry. Um, the traits on the left are the ones that we all think of as being, except for the uncertain about self, You'd like to see in your child. You'd like them to be cautious. You'd like them to be orderly. You'd like them to be focused. You'd like them to be sensitive in the sense of being aware of others, being empathetic. We now know, however, that it is possible to identify 
a cluster of these traits, these being some of the main ones, in young children prior to the onset of any kind of symptomatic behavior at all, that will set them up, depending upon how things play out, for going down a different path in their lives. For those who go down that path, the ones who are cautious become anxious. The ones who are orderly in their schoolwork and in the way they lead their lives become obsessive. I mean, I can remember when my child, Jenny, was seven, and she was a, a prolific reader, and she alphabetized all the books in her room at age seven. And I thought, that's a fine idea. I did that. I had no idea. I thought it made perfect sense. <coughs> Being focused at work, focused at school is helpful becoming so rigid that you can't get your work done unless every single detail and micro anything around you is the way you need it to be becomes unhelpful. Think of this as a progression from helpful to unhelpful, productive to unproductive. The other thing that can happen is that global low self-esteem begins to be evident in the young person along with being sensitive gets to the point where they become difficult to soothe, you all know people, we all know people, uh, who perhaps take almost any comment as a negative one. They perceive fault in themselves no matter what praise they're being given. They have no ability to hang on to anything steady. Everything has to be done over and over again to help them feel better about themselves. These are the ways in which <clears throat> my mother, my daughter, my niece, and myself at different periods <clears throat> were very much alike. This is part of the pattern of anorexia nervosa. One of the things that some of the people in the field are starting to do and are working very hard to do, go back and again, think of alcoholism, think of heart disease, think of um, COPD. If you, as a person in the medical field, are interviewing somebody, you're gonna ask about what are past diseases, what are past illnesses, past difficulties, past whatever, in your in the family. And you're going to get the answers pretty easily. People now also know that they need to ask those same kinds of questions about psychiatric illnesses. Do you have any mental health illnesses in your family? Do you have depression, anxiety, bipolar, <coughs> personality disorder, extreme um, OCD? <coughs> what we now know is that if we can begin to educate the public enough to understand that this kind of constellation of traits seen in young children could be a big flag, if we could help people understand how serious this is and help turn eating disorders back into a psychiatric illness and begin to help folks understand that they need to intervene appropriately early, hard, and well, because nobody wants to lead their lives on this side of the street. This is a very hard life. <clears throat> All of those traits become exacerbated by malnutrition. We also now know that a lot of what was thought about to be um, <coughs> sort of the standard definition of anorexia for the first 40, 50 years, put that now side by side with a definition of malnutrition, you're going to have very, very similar profiles. Malnutrition, chaotic eating, constant purging will lead to obsessiveness about food, obsessiveness about self, rigidity of thinking, um, inability to problem solve, loss of interest in friends, loss of interest in joy, going into a much more of a sort of an ascetic way of life. You literally see people beginning to strip their houses. They have less and less in their houses, and the color leaves their life, their faces, and the walls of where they live. The malnourishment also helps for the comorbid symptoms, which are very handy. The, um, eating disorders do not like to play alone. They like to go hand in hand with bipolar, personality disorders, alcohol, and substance abuse. And again, it's not understood well within society or even within some of the medical communities, the degree to which the malnourishment itself and the chaotic eating are fuel to the fire for those other disorders. 
unless and until you get the eating disorders under control to a certain degree and re-nourish the brain, the kind of symptoms that are going to come from these other comorbid disorders are going to continue to flourish. You cannot treat one and ignore the other. It won't work. These are just some facts from NIDA, from the National Eating Disorders Association. 20 million women, 10 million men. 35 to 57% adolescent girls have begun engaging in crash dieting, fasting, self-induced vomiting, diet pills, or laxatives. Again, going back to the idea that if you're genetically vulnerable, if you know anybody in your family, or your neighbor's family, or your cousin, or your niece, or your nephew, and you know that there's a possibility that they have inherited a higher than usual risk that would put them at risk for developing an eating disorder in life, going on a diet is not a benign decision for that person. And that's another thing that needs to get out there. Going on a diet for 100 fourth graders, um, and I'm running out of time, I'm being told. So I'm going to summarize this really fast. You take 100 fourth graders. They're all from the same school. They all are influenced by the same media, culture, whatever. They grow up in the same town. They decide to go on a diet. Out of the 100, 60%, if they develop an eating disorder at all, 60% of that group that will develop an eating disorder, they are probably going to be able to resolve that eating disorder within one, two, three years without appropriate early outpatient management. Of the 40% that's left, however, 20%, half of that 40% is going to go on to have a full-blown serious eating disorder illness in which you're probably going to see it taking up to about 10 years to recover. I knew at year seven, Jenny was in trouble. I knew that over the next three years, if we didn't help her get out of this, her chances of getting out of it were going to absolutely plummet. Within that group of being treated up until seven to ten years, you have a likelihood of having between two to ten hospitalizations. Not unusual. In the last group, the ones who never recover, the ones who become chronic, their life um, is a state of hell. They will go in and out of hospitals. They will be robbed of their desire to, to have a life full of love. They won't know how to work, they can't keep jobs, they can't keep friends. Um, all they can think about is themselves and their eating disorder. What remains invisible today? And I'll end here. I think if you take the average person on the street and you ask them, what is it like to live with heart disease? What is it like to live with diabetes? What is it like to live <clears throat> with emphysema. They may not be able to give you the, cri the medical criteria, but they would have a sense of how difficult it is to live with all of those disorders. Same thing going these days because of the progress that's been made in the mental health community. You ask anybody on the street, what's it like to live with chronic depression, high anxiety, OCD, schizophrenia? I think you have a fairly <laughs> accurate description of what it's like to live with one of those psychiatric disorders. You ask somebody on the street to describe what is it like to live with an eating disorder, one of the first things they'll say to you is, I wish I had one. Thank you. My job today is to talk about what it was like to have an eating disorder and be a soon-to-be physician. So I actually was a little bit unique in the fact that I developed my eating disorder when I was a first-year medical student and subsequently suffered from anorexia nervosa for the next eight years. So for the two years of my first two years of medical school as well as the six years of my PhD work. So I'm often asked, you know, why, why is it that I get up and I speak about it? now that I'm in recovery, and it's really because of the picture that you see on the screen right now. It's because when I was in the midst of my disease, I could not envision recovery. Hope was so far away from it that I thought my entire life 
was going to essentially be miserable. And I was given what Robbie just mentioned. I was told I was a lifer and that I was going to suffer from it or I was going to die from it. And my next <coughs> location was going to be five feet under the ground by my position. So I decided I wasn't ready to die and I was going to fight this. Um, but throughout the midst of it, I, I could not ever envision my life being as magnificent as it is today. I get to do the thing that I love. I'm healthy. I go out to eat. I enjoy food. I don't over-exercise. I go to the gym when I feel like it. I go to sleep when I want to, and I don't go to the gym. So I enjoy talking to people about how magnificent my life is now and how I never envisioned anything would ever be this grand when I was sick. So what I'm going to do today is walk you through the resources that we publish on the NIDA website for professionals and give you a little bit of information based upon my experiences to, hope you, to help you hopefully in the future as you speak to patients who have eating disorders. So we use this acronym called What's Up Doc to uh, kind of summarize the things that we think are important when you're dealing with an eating disorder patient. So the first one is that weight for an eating disorder patient is not what weight means for the average person. So I love this, actually. One of my friends sent me this, who knows me, and it's, it's absolutely true. That weight, to me, was the number that I cared about at the end of the day. I would wake up in the morning, and I would weigh myself. I would go to bed at night, and I would weigh myself. And depending upon what that number is, valued my self-worth. It told me whether or not I had accomplished something that day. It told me if I was loved by my family, by my friends. It was that number that I chose to focus on because I wanted to numb out all the other stresses of life. I didn't want to think about being a medical student. I didn't want to think about being a graduate student. I didn't want to think about how anxious I was about my relationships, about my family relationships. So I only focused on that one number. So if I walked in to see a physician, or a nutritionist, or a therapist, and all they talked about is that number, I completely tuned them out. I didn't want to hear, I didn't want to hear it, because that number was the only thing I had. So all I wanted to, them to focus on was the behaviors, the emotions, the things that I couldn't control that I needed them to address so I could let go of that number. The next thing is height. So height is really getting into BMI. When I was first diagnosed, I was told that I needed to hit a BMI of 18. Well, BMI of 18 for me is 110 pounds. That was not a healthy weight, but I focused on that. I thought 110 pounds, that's it. That's all I have to do. And I hung at 110 pounds, and I never could reach recovery because that's all I thought I had to weigh. And in reality, I had to let go of that number and say, I'm going to eat healthy, I'm going to not overexercise, and I'm going to find out where my body is going to level off. So I encourage you to not think of a BMI as the optimal health for someone. Anorexia. So unfortunately, Robbie and I represent the minority of patients. The vast majority actually have binge eating disorder. It is twice as common as anorexia and bulimia combined. So bulimia actually is greater even than anorexia. I think you tend to think of anorexia because you see it, it's visual, you can kind of understand it. But it is the minority of the eating disorders. Trauma. Trauma is very common in a lot of eating disorder patients to the fact, to the point that a lot of treatment facilities actually have trauma tracks because people need to deal with the trauma prior to being able to recover. And the side effects. So I actually became sick probably shortly after I started medical school. <clears throat> I had straight A's in the second semester of my medical school. By October of the following year, I couldn't concentrate, I couldn't sleep, I was barely able to memorize anything, I couldn't sit still. So the side effects took a long time for that actually to occur, and yet the disease had really taken hold by the time it became clearly obvious that I wasn't able to function at the level that I needed to. Universal. We talked about this. Robbie talked about it. It affects men. It affects women. It affects all different ethnicities. It is not the adolescent female disease that it was once <clears throat> thought of. Uh, on the junior board, there are six of us. Two of them are currently men. One is a Harvard graduate, was a rower. Um, so it definitely affects people. So don't think just because they're not an adolescent female that it cannot affect them. Purging. Purging is not just vomiting. It's laxatives, it's enemas, it's diuretics, it's excessive exercise, it's diet pills. There are so many things that people do nowadays to purge. Dieting. Diet to me is a four-letter word. I will never use it. <laughs> I hate the word dieting. I believe in moderation. I eat in moderation. I love fruits, I love vegetables, I love whole grains, but if I want dessert, I'm going to have dessert. I was taught to have dessert every day to recover, and I believe in that. So I honestly believe moderation is the key. <laughs> I don't believe in dieting. Um, office, so every last, I will not pick up a magazine to this day. I hate magazines that talk about, oh, you can lose 10 pounds in a week. No, 
they're false, they're lies, it doesn't happen. So think about that when you're putting things out, because they can be terribly triggering for someone with an eating disorder. Um, and compassion, consistency, and care. I wish I could capitalize this. This is exactly what got me here today. I am a product of UVA. My physicians were here, my nutritionists, my therapists, they are the reason that I get to stand here and talk about it. And they are what taught me the characteristics that I hope to possess one day as a physician. They offered me compassion and care every single day, and I owe my life to them. So just to let you know, this is kind of what a treatment team <clears throat> consists of. Um, I put the therapist, nutritionist, and a pediatrician or internist on the bottom because some people um, will also need a psychiatrist. We created this team for me. It's wonderful. They all worked together. They all communicated together. And we were able to find goals and meet those through this team. So I highly, highly encourage everybody to do it because it's just too much of a burden for one person to tackle all of these issues. So these were also timely interventions. So patients with eggs may not recognize that they are ill, and they may be ambivalent about accepting treatment. This is a symptom of their illness. So I looked at this picture, and I thought, there's no way. Look at that girl. She's a skeleton. She, there's no way in that mirror she could envision looking like that. I mean, I just didn't believe it. And then I found this. That's a picture of me. Looks like an 11-year-old girl. I was 24 years old. I was supposed to have just finished my second year of medical school. I had no idea I looked like that. Mm -hmm. I look at that picture and I have heart palpitations because I think of electrolyte abnormalities. I think of heart arrhythmias. I think of all the things that could have gone wrong that could have ultimately resulted in my death. So I did not see it. I did not envision it at all. So keep that in mind that they're going to be difficult to convince that they need to go to treatment because they don't see it. And lots of times you do have to do something to force them to go to treatment. I had an option. I could not go to the lab, and I could go to the hospital, or I could leave my MD, PhD. That saved my life. Parents and guardians are the frontline help seekers for children and adolescents <clears throat> with heads. Trust their concerns. So many times I have, a I have a parent come up to me and say, my pediatrician never believed me that my daughter had an eating disorder or my son had an eating disorder. They know their kids the best. When they come to you, listen to what they're saying. How fun please understand that they did not cause the illness. Neither did their child or their family member choose to have it. So I put this down here about kind of what we believe, sorry, what we believe is it's a genetic, social, and psychological issue that compounds it to form eating disorder. My parents felt horribly guilty. They thought they raised me poorly, and that's why I had an eating disorder, and that was not true. They were wonderful, loving parents. They could not have done anything else for me. It just happened. It just happened, and that's all I can say. Um, monitor, monitor physical health, including vital signs and laboratory tests. I never once had an abnormal lab. You look at that picture, and it's hard to believe, but your body can adjust. I never once had an abnormal lab. Always assess for psychiatric risk, including suicidal uh, <clears throat> self-harm, through plans and intent. Up to one third of deaths related to EDS produce suicide. So I think that the, the the reason that I, I want to emphasize that is every single one of my friends who committed suicide did it when they were a healthy weight. Recovery does not end when you hit your weight restoration. When I hit my weight restoration, I cried every morning, I cried every night, I cried in my therapist's office, I could only wear baggy clothes, I barely made it to work in the lab every day. It was miserable. A year and a half of it. My psychologist will tell you it was miserable for all of us. And it took a year and a half of me being at a healthy weight prior to being able to function normally again, get up and wear pants. I remember this day when one of my friends took me shopping and I was able to put on a pair of pants after two years of not being able to wear one type of fitting pants. And so I encourage you to think that suicide risk doesn't end just with that. The last thing I wanted to cover is a little bit about what it would be like to go to a treatment facility. I think it scares people because it's unknown. So this is kind of just a brief overview of what it's like every single day. You can see that most of it's focused around food. You go for breakfast. When you sit in a meal table with everyone there who's suffering, you have a psychologist who's there with you to help you through it, and then afterwards you process it. It is tremendous. It is what enabled me to expose myself to so many fear foods because I had that type of support for every single meal and every single snack. The rest of the day is interspersed with groups. Those groups include all of the following at the bottom. And you also tend to usually either see your psychologist or your psychiatrist 
once, a, once a, a day, so they alternate depending upon what day it is. So just to assuage the fears about what it is like, this is actually a collage of my first treatment facility. Um, I am friends with a lot of them. This was my room on the bottom. Um, this was actually the, uh, so up at the top was actually the bulletin board that I redid that really didn't help with my OCD diagnosis. But the rest of it is all um, pictures of what it is. There's this swing in the background. This was the healing garden. I sat on that swing. I wrote for so many hours. Um, and so I, I really cherish the time that I spent treatment. But I spend as much time as I do working for Anita because I was fortunate. My parents could afford treatment. It is $2,500 per day if your insurance company does not cover it. So keep that in mind. That's why I fight for insurance companies to cover eating disorders because it enabled me to get to where I am. Thank you. disordered eating and exercise and body image issues at uh, the University of Virginia. So it's a wide range, which you'll see. So I put up here some student quotes so you can read them. I think it's really important to note that um, a lot of these are from people that don't have eating disorders. Um, we know that it's a, a spectrum, right? We all probably know that we've had times where we've maybe dieted a little bit or we were paying a, a lot of attention to what we were eating or we were had a, maybe a healthy, what we thought was healthy exercise regimen that was maybe a little too much for us. Um, so these come from all different kinds of students, right? I see people and talk to people every day. Um, first thing when my mom calls, she asks me, have you gained weight? Um, I hear a lot of comments related to recruitment of sororities and things like that, but it's not just that. Um, also people that are from different countries um, with different sort of beauty ideals families asking lots of questions or, um, you know, have you gotten fat, that kind of thing. That in their, the parents think they're being helpful. <clears throat> so just to set the stage, um, we have some of these statistics Robbie went over, but I think it's really startling um, that 74% of women choose an ideal body shape that's 10 to 20% um, below the ideal. And in a way that makes sense, right, because it's normative to look at magazines of women that are not at all healthy and want to look like them, right? We see that. Um, so I think this data reflects that. <clears throat> Another one is that 42% of first and third graders, three third graders, want to be thinner. You know, I talk to my friends all the time that have children, and one this week said that her daughter said, ran in and said, I don't want to be fat. And she said, well, what do you mean by that? I, I, don't, I don't know. I heard it at school. I don't want to be fat. You know, so she doesn't even know what she's talking about, but she's getting these messages. Um, or one friend that had a daughter that came back from school and said, I can't drink milk because that'll make me fat. And again, she didn't really even know what that was, but she was starting to com communicate those messages, right? Because they're so rampant. They're normative. I say the whole United States has an eating disorder, but it's not the <laughs> diagnosable kind. Um, National College Health Assessment. So this is some data for college, um, about college students, which UVA participates in this data collection. Um, one thing that I think is very startling is that 21% of college students that took this said that their appearance was traumatic or difficult to handle. I think those words are strong, that one out of five students says that their appearance is traumatic or difficult to handle. And of course, not surprisingly, 80% experience um, average, um, above average, or tremendous stress. So that's something that we work in um, with the Women's Center is trying to teach healthy coping mechanisms because we see that students oftentimes are creating unhealthy coping mechanisms for the stress that they have in their lives. And sometimes that centers around food and exercise and body image issues. One piece that's been mentioned is parents are the number one source of information about um, weight and shape. And medical providers are number two. You think that might be lower down on the list, but they're not. And I think that that is actually a great opportunity. Um, if you are a doctor and you want to learn how to more sensitively communicate information about weight and shape, then we absolutely have information for that. Um, this is closer to home. There's some national data about student health usage and utilization that 
the Office of Health Promotion at Student Health gave us. Yay, they're here in the audience. Um, <laughs> and I thought this was dramatic. I, it was the, um, it's the visits per patient by diagnosis. And this is national data, but you can see that eating disorders is number one, which we do not want to be. Um, but it's 5.52 visits um, for in the national data, and in UVA, it's 6.88. Now, the increase could be, due, could be due to the fact that we have a counseling center, and some colleges don't, so we actually have more resources. But at the same time, you can tell that even though the numbers of patients might be um, smaller than some other um, illnesses, um, the, the intensity of resources they need is the highest. Um, another thing is from 2011 to 2012, no, actually I think that's supposed to be 2013, it's two years of data, there were 192 uh, individuals seen at um, our student health that had classified eating disorders. Now that's just diagnosable. And again, the diagnosable eating disorders that you've heard about a lot today are a very small percentage um, of the issues that we see. We see mostly disordered eating um, in my prevention program. So um, that is having behaviors that are like eating disorders, but they're not as extreme. You don't meet all of the criteria. So I think that if you think about that just as being kind of a flash in the pan of issues that we're seeing, it's, whoo, sorry, um, that's pretty huge. And um, yeah, so let's see. Okay, we also see a lot of costs. Um, <laughs> um, the costs to the individual, to the student are huge. And again, this is not, and I know I keep saying this, it's not necessarily that they're diagnosed, it's all over the map. Um, we see physical, mental, emotional health issues, um, comorbidity, a lot of anxiety. Um, people spending a lot of time on these issues, and so they're not able to use that time for other things, right? There's opportunity cost to staying in your room and, and um, you know, trying, taking a long time to get ready in the morning or exercising for two hours every day even if you're sick, um, you know, those kinds of things. Also groups, um, relationships and family. Every week, I think this semester, I have had several students come in talking to me about their friends that they're concerned about. And that's usually where I get, um, uh, I have connections with students. I don't always get the individual students sometimes that are worried about themselves. But they are worried about their friend because their relationships are hurting. This person is harming themselves, they're doing things they're worried about, and they never see them anymore. They're always busy, they're never around. Um, and their family, obviously. In school, too, their family's not here to be able to necessarily see what's going on so their friends know. Um, university, you know, grades, leadership opportunities. You know, a lot of times when I talk to students, they say that the cost is, what if you don't get a good grade, right? But I say you're here at college because you're supposed to be learning what you want to do for your whole life. <laughs> you know, you're supposed to be studying and being interested in this. So, yeah, grades are important, but also what, what do you want to do? You know, what leadership opportunities are you missing because you're spending a lot of time on these other activities? And then, of course, I think the costs are these unattainable norms that we create. Um, I think very much it was, um, we are a nation, um, a culture of extremes. So we're seeing, as we have these extreme images, we're seeing this, you know, obesity epidemic, and then we're seeing, you know, this focus on trying to be thinner and thinner and thinner. And I'm saying, in our current situation, is it working? I don't think so. It's, it seems like it's getting worse. Um, okay, so I, my program, we also call it body positive programming, because people don't necessarily want me to come in and say, hi, I'm an eating disorders education um, educator, let's talk, you know. People are like, ah, I'm right out of the room. So um, <laughs> we work to reduce eating disorders, um, disordered eating, exercise, body image concerns on grounds. We conduct evidence-based body image interventions. Um, one is reflections. It's a um, evidence-based um, body image intervention that reduces risk factors associated with eating disorders. I collect data on that and um, track it with the national data, and it, it, we have seen really good results with that. Um, we also make referrals, and we become kind of a model um, for college eating disorder prevention programs. We speak at national conferences, and we wouldn't be able to do any of this without the coalition. Um, we have a coalition on eating disorders and exercise concerns, and I think it's absolutely a model coalition for other colleges. I get questions constantly um, from colleges that um, want to have guidance about how to create that kind of coalition. And really quickly, I just wanted to show you the spectrum. So I mentioned that earlier. 
So what I see mostly, right, is this disordered eating. So similar behavior, similar to those with eating disorder, but less frequent or intense. So when you are diagnosed with bulimia, um, there are very specific diagnostic criteria. You know, you, and I don't know, I know it's changing, but within a week, a period of time, you purge a number, a certain number. Well, what if you don't purge that number and you don't have that diagnosis? That could also be called eating disorders not otherwise specified, which is down there in the little um, the, the diagnostic criteria bubble. Um, but we also see people that are just sort of flirting with unhealthy behaviors. And they may go from disordered eating, and they may go into eating disorders, or they may pop right back into healthy relationships with food and exercise and body image. And that's what our program works on. We want to try to move people that are thinking about these issues back into that healthy relationship. And of course, we see body image issues and disordered um, exercise. Okay. The, the last thing I wanted to say, and it, um, it really, I didn't even have it in my prepared talk, but from listening to them, um, it made me think I wanted to share it, that along with dieting, body dissatisfaction, so not feeling good about your body, shaming, feeling, having those negative thoughts, that is not benign either. So it's, some people, you know, put the picture of the skinny model on the refrigerator to say, I'm not going to go in there and eat that. I mean, you see that on TV shows, you probably know friends that have done that. Or they, or you think if you feel negatively about yourself, then somehow that will change your behavior. And that doesn't work. Um, actually, it leads to eating disorders, some other unhealthy behaviors um, that can be really scary on down the road, but it also leads to weight gain, which I don't think people know. So we focus on having a mindful, positive relationship with exercise, eating disorders, and body image, um, and really work on creating that relationship so that the person can flourish through um, their life. So here's, again, we have body positive at UVA. If you ever see the apple and pear, that's part of what we do um, with some other, um, some of our uh, coalition members. And then resources, and here's some people from um, the Women's Center. So that's it. Thank you all. We have time now for comments and questions, and uh, Eric and Evan are here with microphones uh, to bring to you. I would ask when you make your comment or ask your question, please also identify yourself. And also, if you have to wait a couple seconds for a mic to get to you, um, please do that because we do need the, the uh, amplification so that it ends up on the video as well. I just wanted to point out, some of what I've presented is actually in this guide, the AED guide for eating disorders. Um, they are available outside. We ordered a hundred of them. Please take them, pass them around to friends, people that you would know. We would love to have them all gone. I can order more if you'd like them. Hello, my name is Karen Knight and I'm in the Health Sciences Library. My question is, um, I got the sense from all of your presentations that overeating is not considered an eating disorder. And so I'm wondering whether it's from a DSM perspective or just clinical perspective, morbid obesity, overeating, where does that fall on the spectrum? Um, that's an excellent question and it's a source of a lot of misunderstanding, again, in society. PED, binge eating disorder, is a diagnosable eating disorder. However, a lot of people have trouble distinguishing between binge eating disorder and obesity. Many people with binge eating disorder are obese. Many people with obesity have binge eating disorder, but they are not synonymous. Is that helpful? And I think it's not, I, I don't know the statistic right now, but I don't think it's a a very large one of people that um, have both. I think it's like 20% or something of people with binge eating disorder or obese. So I guess my point is to say that you don't necessarily know, do you know what I mean, by looking at someone mm -hmm. that, because I've, I've had people say to me, oh, well, you know, that person must have binge eating issues, um, and they may not. So. But we definitely work on that um, uh, in our program related to just you know, are you eating too little? Are you eating too much? We're not so much into the labels as much as trying to figure out how much time people are thinking about what they're doing and preparing for that and worrying about it and then saying, well, that doesn't seem possibly like that's a healthy, um, a healthy activity for you. Let's figure out how we can change that so that it's more in balance. 
Um, my name is Lynn Wells. I'm an anesthesiologist at the university. And my question um, is probably for Amy. Um, we know that men have eating disorders, same as women, but you are based in the women's center. So how does that work mm -hmm. for men who are having eating disorders? That's a really good question. Um, well, we have, yes. So my program is obviously the Women's Center. We do have counseling and programs for men. People might not know about that, but we do. Um, but obviously, they're not necessarily going to come to the Women's Center for that. Um, I think that, you know, within the coalition and the, the group of people that we work with, we're trying, we've tried really hard to incorporate men. My idea as a public health person is that we need champions to come forward that are interested in creating that program. Because I can't create that program for men. Do you know what I mean? I'd love to support it and help it. 10% um, of people with eating disorders um, are diagnosed are men. Um, but then, of course, men have that disordered um, uh, area, too, like on the slide. And um, that looks different from women. It could be more about muscle building, buffness. Um, steroids can be more of an issue, that kind of thing. Um, but so I guess I'm saying that I think that's something that we need. And we've had um, individuals that are interested, but it's hard to get people, I mean, at this time it, within the university, to want to come together and, and help create something for men by men. And I just want to add real quick because Amy and I were both, and none of us happen to mention it, but actually February is National Eating Disorder Awareness Month. Mm -hmm. The end, of the last week, we do um, events throughout the university for eating disorder awareness. Um, and we actually, Amy and I spoke at an event last year called From Our Active Minds, and I would say 50% of the people who came to the event were undergraduate men with that same question as to how do I get help, how does a friend get help, and we do have an association at UVA, and, and I can't remember, it's like men aware of eating disorders or something along those lines that is available as well, and they were phenomenal. I, I did the need to walk in um, at the beginning of this year, and a lot of them came and supported it. Oh, and I have to say, yeah, I didn't mean to indicate, we, we absolutely have counseling services at CAPS and resources for people um, if they need help. Um, but in terms of having an entity on grounds, we don't have that yet. We do have male educators on disordered eating, but they actually, their focus is to educate men about women's body image issues so they can better communicate that. So it's a little bit different, <laughs> but that's what they wanted to focus on. And it's a student-led organization, which I think is amazing. Of course, I tried to say, do you want to talk to men? And they were like, no, we don't want to do that. So, <laughs> so, so we're trying. Let me add, please, that on the NEED website, uh, which I've put up here for you, there are lots and lots of different resources for anybody interested at any level of information about eating disorders. One of the things we've tried very hard, we have a section called Stories of Hope, and there are a lot of young men uh, who have submitted their stories there. And so if you're looking for help in some ways, in some direction, I, I urge you, again, go to the NEED website. The other thing is, that I wanted to let you know. In addition to this, of uh, the AMA course that was up there previously, on the NEDA website, um, we have a section of videos. They're part of an online web um, process. I, I'm sorry, I thought I'd have a slide up. Funded by NIS, National Institutes of Health. Um, they're an ongoing thing to try to help try to educate people around the world about mental health disorders and eating disorders as well. And there are some absolutely wonderful videos on there about all sorts of aspects of eating disorders. Um, I have a question up here. Um, I'm Dr. Jim Turner. I, I'm Executive Director for Student Health and Counseling Center and um, Health Promotion Report to me. And uh, I really appreciate your comments today. It was uh, wonderful set of uh, presentations. I, I wanted to reassure the audience that we do have comprehensive eating disorder services at Student Health. Uh, as Amy uh, mentioned, we, we see about 100 a year and uh, have a treatment team, so we're available for that. Um, I have colleagues here from uh, the Division of Student Affairs and many other colleagues, and I'll, I'll tell you that one of the major struggles we have in managing eating disorders among our students is getting them, the individual, to come in for help. 
we end up having support groups for the friends of these people who were so frustrated because the student will not come in. Can you give us in three minutes or less advice about how we can uh, do interventions and get these usually women and sometimes men in for help? Can I say one thing? Sure. Okay. I think as Brooks mentioned, this is part of the, the disease. Different from other diseases, they want to become better anorexics. It's not that they want more beer. They want to become a better anorexic. The more that you can disseminate that information in general at all levels within your campus and just help people understand that that's part of the disease and to keep plugging away and to keep pushing and to keep begging and to keep asking is important information to have. And I have some really specific things. And so anyone can, ever, can come to the Women's Center and talk to me about this. I see people all the time, just so you know if you want more in-depth information. But, um, I think there's a couple things. Um, one is, you know, we talk a lot about um, when you're speaking to that person, how to be someone that is a close friend. So if you have, let's say we have this individual that we're worried about, and there are a bunch of friends that are worried about this person, pick the person that's the closest to them. Um, talk to them in a way that is obviously supportive. So I do um, coaching with people about using I statements. Um, so you don't want to be the food police. You don't want to say you, you know, you haven't done this. You haven't done this. Or you're not eating. Or I've noticed, you know, I'm really concerned about you because blah blah blah. You know, the information that you share. I noticed that you don't hang out with us anymore because you're always at the gym. And I'm really worried that I've heard, you know, that you've hurt your leg and you still keep going. Um, what is that like for you? How does that feel? So that kind of engaging in those discussions. And we have information on our website, and so does Student Health, Health Promotion, and the Coalition about how to talk to a friend that you're concerned about. And we also prepare people for the reaction to that, right? Because it might not be, um, oh, great. <laughs> I'm going to make an appointment. Um, but you know, it helps. We see people all the time in, in the Women's Center in the counseling services, I am told, that come in and say, I don't really want to be here, but my roommates keep bothering me about this. Um, and or my mom or that kind of thing and so we also try to use the resources available um, whether it be the friends saying why don't I walk you over their open hours of cats let's walk over together and talk about this or sometimes especially if it's anorexia based um, it's important to not focus on um, the food part of it not to say you look too skinny that can be considered a compliment so you want to stay away from food and image um, re references and instead say, you know, there are other things going on, right? You're really stressed. I see how you're crying all the time. We had one student that said, that, um, a friend that said they were worried because the person said, I don't remember what it's like to be happy. You know, those are the things that are obviously really, really concerning, and they can also help so that the person feels less stigma related to food uh, when they come in. I definitely would add that it, in my experience, it's helped to have one I, I, I had people who stepped out and or who stepped out and had suffered from it and had gone through it and who went to treatment and who sat down and had lunch with me and said this is what you have to expect um so i think it helps to have somebody close to you it worked well for me to have somebody i respected a physician uh, a professor somebody who you respect to say you know this is what i think is going on and would you be willing to to do this because we're concerned about the thing that you cross for me it was my academic work and I think that that's also really important that you have to, I tell everybody you have to want something more than you want the disease. And I wanted my MD PhD more than I wanted the disease. So I decided whatever it took, if I died trying to recover from it, that was better than dying with the disease. And sometimes too, just getting that person in the door. So, you know, I've said, um, you know, if the person is really into dieting and they want to figure out the best diet, then maybe the entry place is for them to see a nutritionist. And they're not, they're thinking, oh, this person's going to help me get skinny. And that's not really what's going to happen, but it's an entryway into the medical, you know, community and a way of getting help. And so those are the things that I try to help people with. Let's figure out the strategy um, and what works for this person. It's time to close our hour, but I'd like you to thank uh, Robbie Munn and Brooks um, Broderick and Amy Chestnut for what I think have been not only informative but very courageous presentations. Um, and I hope this hour has been helpful.
so many people from the UVA um, support services, student services here today as well. We invite you to join us next week for a program on deafness and community uh, representations of cultural resistance with um, English professor Chris Krentz and a visiting disability studies scholar Rebecca Garden from Upstate Medical University in New York. So we'll see you next week.